you would turn, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. The title of the message today is Facing the Lion. It's the second of a four-part message that will conclude on the first Sunday of Can you? This? I'm talking into this one for now. Can you guys hear me? Hello, 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 hello. Ah! Sound like Verizon. I know, I feel like Verizon. A week ago, I was, we, Penny and I were in Cincinnati for a graveside service, funeral in the cemetery. And one person, two people, I guess their phones would work, they had ATT. The rest of us there was a guy drove around town. He said, there are all of four cars in Cincinnati today. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's word? Next week, preaching a Mother's Day message. The following week, we'll have Nord and Doris Chasen, missionaries. Then Memorial Day weekend, we get back to this sermon series and conclude it the first week of June. Reading verses 10 through 20, I'll be preaching verses 11 through 17 today. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to rest, resist in the day of evil and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your waist girded with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit always with all kinds of prayer and supplication. To that end, be alert with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Pray for me that the power to speak may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Father, please anoint me to be able to preach your word, Lord, under the unction of the Holy Spirit in the power of the Spirit, only what you want and preach, Lord. And Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd help us all hear what it is the Spirit wants to say to the church today. To us, we ask for revelation Lord, and that you would use this to help end, Lord, the enemy's field day and uh, good times amongst our body, that we would be able to walk in victory and stand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to be seated, this is a series about the Holy Spirit. So if you turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Beginning of verse 14, Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would give you according to the riches of his glory. And what does he give us? What does he want us to receive? Power to be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. Whatever it is you're facing, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, if it's internal, could be family, it could be people at your workplace, could be your neighbors, could be your past, could be fear of the future. This is one of the keys to your answer, being strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inner man. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's what happens when we receive him as Savior. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Folks, if you want to survive, if you want to have victory, we cannot do it apart from being filled with the love of God inside us. If you have difficulty receiving God's love, keep, we claim, receive his love by faith. Even if you don't feel loved, say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me. And believing and say, I believe, and that relates to this message today. Say, I believe that God loves me even if I don't feel like it. And all the echoes from my past and all the voices from my past are contrary. I believe it. 
Paul is praying that the Holy Spirit will come and we will know the depth of the love of Jesus Christ in us. That we might be filled with the fullness of God and it's through that love that we receive that fullness. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine, that means we can't even imagine it, according to the power that works in us. His Holy Spirit's power. It's all having to do with the Spirit. If you turn to chapter 5, Verses 15 through 18 in context. See then what that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise men, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Folks, we live in evil days. We, some of us, we have good days, we have bad days, but every day is evil because sin reigns in this world and Satan is still the ruler of the air of this world. Every day is evil. Even though we may have better days. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. We receive the Spirit, we're filled with the Spirit, just like we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, by faith. By faith. It's not some incantation. God doesn't withhold it from some. He will grant it to everyone. Amen. So now I've gone to this one. Yes. Thank you, Erica. So a week ago, the message was take responsibility for your life. It was verse 10. Take responsibility for your life. Quit playing the victim and take responsibility for your life. How? By being strong in the Lord. By having a sweet relationship with him in which you spend time in his presence and you talk to him all day. And, you, and I've said this and I'll say it and I'll say it again and again. Folks, if you will commit to reading the Bible every day and spending time in his presence in prayer, you give him time. You may not sense his presence then, but if you are faithful and keep pursuing him, you will sense his presence at unexpected times when he draws near to you. If we draw near to him, he promises to draw near to us, but not necessarily when we want it. But he will. And so be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might in his power, which is endless. He has more power than we, he has reserves. And so in the power of his might. Now, I have two short videos. Mark, if you turn the lights down, please. They're really short. We're going to show them to you one after another to introduce today's topic. Cause you had a bad So which are you? Are you the person that face plants and get up and shakes it off and goes on? Or are you the person who loses it? <laughs> oh. Which person are you? How do you react? Can't hear me? Can you boost it? Oh, it would help if I turned it on, wouldn't it? <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad you said something. It's driver, I told you that. I, that's why I don't carry around my Bible. How do you react when life gets difficult? How do you react? I 
I get so frustrated sometimes in counseling. People come in and tell me what's going on. And sometimes I feel like saying, don't you have any fight in you whatsoever? Sometimes people, when they, they hit a wall or they, they come under attack, and we've had attack. We've had a lot of attacks in the church. You know, a few weeks ago, I, I told you last week that there were 40 to 50 people missing on a Sunday, many because of uh, sickness, others because of furnace had collapsed the night before, and lots of reasons. Penny and I went home, I texted and called people, 40 to 50 people, legitimate reasons, and since then, I've come under attack. Tim Bennett said during the evangelistic services, he'd had, I don't know, half a dozen things go wrong in 24 hours, and he said, that spiritual attack. I don't believe in coincidence. But what do you do when you get attacked? Some people isolate. They roll over. They just curl up. They withdraw. Some people lash out. <laughs> the, the garbage man. <laughs> Been there, done that. I don't do that anymore, I don't think. Do I, Mrs. Nino? No. But I used to. I used to have times like that. What do you, how do you react? Some of us, you know, some of us, I wish you fought less. But some of you got to get some fight in you. But this is the main point. You'll see it on the overhead. Fight for your life. Last week was take responsibility for your life. This week is fight for your life. But we're going to fine tune that. Fight. Fight. Quit rolling over playing dead. Quit getting mad and, and attacking people. That's not fighting. Fight God's way. Fight, but fight God's way. If you roll over and play dead or you just curl up in a ball and withdraw or you start lashing out and attacking people, you lose. You lose if you isolate. You lose if you curl up in a ball. You lose if you attack. You lose either way because it's out of us. It's out of the flesh. Whenever we react in the flesh, it's us. That person that's giving you such a hard time, you're so angry with them, you know what? They may not be the problem. You might be the problem. There are three things that you and I need to practice if we're going to fight God's way. Would you say it with me? Fight, fight. God's, way. God's way. Fight, fight. God's, way. God's way. Thank you. Three things we need to practice. And the first is, and I'll tell you what they are. Rip. Say with me, rip. R-I-P. Come on, everybody. Rip. R.I.P. means rest in peace, right? Well, in this case, it means die to self and rest in his peace. Die to self, rest in his peace. Recognize, recognizing, immersing, and persevering. First, recognize. We must be recognizing on a regular basis that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but the powers and principalities of the air. Right in there. So when you're discouraged and you're feeling like, well, nobody loves me, I'm a, such a failure, life is miserable, you need to recognize that that's spiritual attack. When somebody cuts you off or mistreats you at work and they call you a foul name, they get short with you and you're like, what did I do? Or what they, another favorite, they have to do a job and they leave early and you have to pick up the mess. You don't wrestle with flesh and blood. You wrestle with the powers and principalities of the air. We need to recognize, and it's not easy. When we're in the middle of it, our first thought is, Rrr. right? However you react to those situations, we tend, and we, we need to do a stop and say, whoa, this is spiritual in nature. When you're feeling depressed, you roll out of bed and you feel depressed, that's spiritual in nature. You know, there are sometimes we have chemical imbalances. You... If you're taking medicines and you're off your medicine, you know that. Do the right thing and take it. But short of that, and when you have conflict in the workplace or in the family, and Don wants to poke me in my nose, Lisa wants to lay me on the road, <laughs> I got to remember that this is spiritual conflict. And you know what? When people are aggravating you or, or you feel attacked, it may not be them that the enemy is using. Because the Bible says that everyone 
who's not, a born, who, who's not born again, who's not a Christian, who's not made Jesus their Lord and Savior, everyone is under the control of the evil one. Don't be surprised when they act that way. Don't be surprised when the average person who doesn't know Jesus doesn't act like a Christian. Be surprised when they do. And even the ones that do are still miserable. The, most, the kindest person you know is still miserable to someone because we all have the sin nature. So recognize, and the reason I say all that is because, you know what, if Brianna and I have a conflict, we, I don't know, I step on her toes and she gets mad at me and she goes, <laughs> and I go, <laughs> it may not be her issue, it could be that the enemy's making inroads in my heart. Did I react in offense? Am I taking offense? Am I holding bitterness? Did I lash out in a way that Christ, just because she acts a certain way doesn't mean that the devil's using her. He could be affecting me. There's nobody who's not influenced by the enemy. Nada. Not, not one. So we need to recognize spiritual attack. Secondly, Paul says we, that he, he references the schemes of the devil. That word schemes is methodia. What's that sound like? Method. It's a compound word from two in the Greek. Meta, which means after, and hodos, which means away. After a way, after a way, a pattern, after a, how many of you do the same thing every morning when you get up? Some of you comb your hair. Some of us take a blob of bath wash and we just, one dab will do me, I'm all done. <laughs> Some of you have a certain way that you react when you get under pressure. You have developed a methodology. The devil has a method. He doesn't have to create anything new. His schemes are methods that he's developed. He just keeps following the same pattern. And let me show you the three main schemes of the devil. Genesis chapter 3. The devil said, the serpent said to Eve, did God really say? Raising doubt. Doubt is one of the, one of the key ingredients that the enemy uses against us. Doubt about your relationship with God. Am I really saved? Does he love me? Does he still love me? Doubt about God. Why would you do this? Why are you allowing me to suffer this way? Who do you think you are? Doubt about God. Doubt about God's word. Maybe those promises are good for you, Karen and Lee, but not for me. Maybe they're good for me and not for you. Uh-oh. Doubt. Doubt about our insecurity. A lot of insecurity comes from doubt. The second one. The devil said to her, you will not surely die. Lies. Two of the methods that the enemy uses are to bring doubt into our minds and lies. And it worked. Did God really say? Well, that was doubt. You will not surely die. He always makes his truth with lie. Did they die? Spiritually, yes. Physically on the spot, no, but yes. They didn't drop dead physically, but there, something changed in their system. So they died eventually. Their body had changed. The sin nature was introduced. Death was introduced. So yes, they died immediately, but folks, when we believe a lie, any lie you believe, it is a scheme of the devil. Any lie you believe about yourself, but any lie you believe about other people. I tell people all the time, this is Pastoral Counseling 101, we are always in danger when we guess another person's motives. Well, this person didn't talk to me because of this. This person is acting this way because of this. You don't know. Do you, are you all-knowing? Are you God Almighty? We don't know. So we believe lies about other people. And I can tell you what, I know I'm not God Almighty. I wouldn't want the job. And I'm not good enough. The third scheme of the devil he said to Eve, when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened to know the difference between good and evil. God knows us. Temptation. Temptation. Look how good this is. Oh, jeez. Test a word of knowledge. In my prayer time this morning downstairs, what God brought to my mind was ruby, red ruby lips. Ruby red lips. 
And what I think he was saying is that there's a man in this service who's finding someone that's not his wife very attractive. And God is saying, you need to repent. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> but if that happens to be you, if you can let me know sometime that I was accurate in that assessment, I would appreciate it because it needs to be tested. Temptation. That's the temptation. The woman who asked me to come to her room when we were on vacation. We were on vacation, right? We were on vacation. Remember that? <laughs> Sorry, it's just all the days are blending together. That was a temptation. Temptation. And so he was tempting them to do something that God had forbidden. But you know what? All three of these collectively gather together. In some recipe, they bring offense. <coughs> They took, Adam and Eve took offense with God because they had doubts about his goodness. They had doubts about his word. They believed a lie and they fell to temptation. They were offended by God. How do I get there? God, you've created this good thing and you don't want me to have it. I am offended, so I'm going to eat it. And I would dare say that most of the time, now this is my opinion, most of the time when we take offense, we have fallen prey to one of those three schemes of the devil or some combination of them. Does that, do you follow me? Every fail, every time you feel like a failure, you feel like you're being ground under the, uh, the boot of the enemy, or you feel crummy, whether it's fear of failure, accusations, uh, discouragement, the roots, I believe, are always going to come down to those, one of those three or some combination of those three to make you feel the way you are. Those are the schemes of the devil. <coughs> Folks, if you don't recognize that the conflict you're having with someone else is spiritual... And that, and that you could be falling prey to one of those three, or maybe the other person is, but worry more about yourself than the other person. Right? If you don't realize that, you're going to lose the battle because you won't fight a spiritual battle. When you're feeling worthless and you're having trouble getting out of bed or you're laying in the fetal position, if it's not a chemical imbalance, the devil is kicking you. It is a spiritual battle. And God has provided his spirit. Ask for more spirit. He's provided his spirit, but it's not just being baptized in the spirit. We need the spirit's power, but folks, folks, he's given us responsibility. That brings us to number two. Well, let's back up. How many of you have heard of James Jonestown? Jonestown. Anybody who wasn't alive in 1978? Okay, those of you who weren't alive, any of you know what Jonestown is? Anybody under, anybody? Okay. How many of you who were alive in 1978 remember what happened in 1978, Jonestown? Jim Jones, a cult leader, cult, C-U-L-T. He gained the trust of Americans, took them overseas, created his own little village in Guyana. I think it's Guyana. In one day, 900, I think it was 18, died. Most of them by mass suicide by drinking the Kool-Aid that was laced with poison. How did they get to the place? Normal people like you and I are. How did they get to the place where they trusted a man and eventually he brainwashed them so much? Now, there were some that were forced to do different things, but a lot of them drank the Kool-Aid willingly. Because they didn't recognize the spiritual warfare. They didn't recognize the lies. They didn't recognize the schemes of the devil or the temptation. Whatever offenses they were acting to, they didn't recognize. Folks, we need to recognize. Recognition is not enough, but recognition is the prerequisite to get it right. Isn't it? Second, immersion. Paul says, put on the full armor of God. Put on. One way of expressing that is it, it, it means kind of sinking down into a garment. How many of you like to sink down into a fleecy garment? Sink down into a nice warm bed on a cold winter night. How about a nice cool bed on a nice hot summer night? Like sinking down. And then he says, take up the full armor of God. Take up. And that means to receive up. In both cases, there's a choice that you and I make, but in both cases, there's a past. We, we receive it. Somebody else is giving it to us. 
The full armor of God. There have been books written about it. There have been pa pastors who have preached probably whole series on just the full armor of God. Okay, this is dangerous ground, what I'm going to say. Let me tell you the bottom line. Putting on the full armor of God is putting on Jesus. End of story. If you pray every day and you put on the helmet of salvation, uh, yeah, and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth, and you pray that prayer every day, unless you have a living relationship with Jesus Christ and you're spending time with him and you're immersed in him, you waste your time. Don't go looking around and trying to read books on the full armor of God and how to be at victory over the enemy. Folks, there's no, it is a metaphor. The belt of truth is Jesus Christ. He is the truth. And it's truth that comes from him. It's walking in the truth. What is one of the tools of the enemy? Lies. Doubts, but what's the truth? God is good. The lie, you're not worth anything. He died for you. The truth is you're valuable. You'll never amount to anything. Oh, yeah, he has work for you to do. The good work he's begun in you, he'll accomplish. Standing on the promises. Oh, we'll get to standing. Good choice of songs. So, well, we had standing on the promises. We did stand in the promises, though, this service, too, so it was good. It's, it's Jesus. The breastplate of righteousness, you and I aren't righteous. What the enemy does is he'll come and whisper in your ear, remember what you did 10 years ago? Remember what you said to this person? How many of you feel guilty when you remember those things? Come on, raise your hands. I do. You know where victory lies? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we are his righteousness. We are righteousness in him. It's not our righteousness. But repentance is required. If you keep committing the same sin and it's sin and you keep doing it and you don't confess it, folks, the armor of God is going to do you no good. Immersing yourself in Jesus because you are guilty and you know you're guilty. But when we confess and we repent, his righteousness is good enough. How many are glad that his righteousness is good enough? It's his righteousness that covers our heart. What's it say? The shield of faith. Those shields were two feet by four feet, roughly, or two and a half by four and a half, depending on who you believe. They were made of wood and leather. They put out the fiery darts. The enemy would soak the arrows in flammable material, light it. You had an incoming, woo! And those wood and leather shields put it out. And the Roman soldiers would interlock them. They were built so they could interlock, you know? And so you had a wall. The shield of faith. Faith in what? You better not have faith in yourself. That's not going to carry you very far. It's not going to do it. Faith in Jesus. Faith in every promise in that book. Faith in what he says that is true about you, even if you don't feel it. Faith that what he says is true. The sword of the Spirit. I said it last week. You and I need to be in this every day reading it systematically. You don't have to read a lot. Just read a little every day. Because it says the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Holy Spirit. If you were in this, he can bring to your mind, when the enemy attacks, he can bring to your mind the truth that sets you free. Remember, it is the truth that sets us free, the Bible says. And as you and I read this, he'll bring it to your mind. And just like Jesus in the wilderness, when he was tempted by Satan, he used Scripture to back Satan up. It's the truth that sets you free. You believing in yourself does you no good. Because the enemy will remind you of every stinking thing you've ever done. He'll remind you of the stinking thoughts and the terrible things that you covet in your heart. It is only through Jesus that we're free. Feet are shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. It struck me, our feet are shod with the readiness. The readiness of the gospel of peace. They wore sandals that had knobs on them. So when they put their feet down, they didn't skid. Chuck and I, we could go out here right now, take our shoes off. We both got socks on. We pushed, we'd slide. One of us had our shoes on. I'll keep mine on. I'll push him around. <laughs> He's stronger than I am, but I, I could push him around because he has stocking feet. But if you had those Roman sandals, I wouldn't push you anywhere. The readiness of the gospel. 
It's not just the gospel, the readiness of the gospel, so that if we, have, we know we have peace with God, we have peace in ourselves because he has forgiven us, we have peace with one another because we work for that, the enemy can't push us around. Go ahead, devil. You want to tell me that I'm not worth anything? I have my shield of faith. Helmet of salvation. Knowing that we're saved. Knowing that we have a relationship with God. A mind that's controlled by God. We know it. Go ahead, hit me with your best shot. Because he will hit you with doubts. He'll hit you with lies. He'll hit you with temptations. And he'll try to get you to take offense at God and other people. And as soon as you take the bait of Satan and take that offense, the enemy has, he's edging you to defeat and himself toward victory. We protect ourselves through the full armor of God, and it's that relationship with Jesus. And so I need to know that he says I'm a dear, beloved child. Ephesians, read Ephesians 1 through all the way through because it says we're seated with him in the heavenlies. We stand before him as holy vessels. He has work for us to do that we will accomplish because he preordained it, and he's good. We're children of God. We're seated with him in the heavenlies. Even now he sees this as a finished work. Go ahead. If I'm Satan, Mark, and I say, you're worthless, you can't amount to anything, you can't do anything right, you can say, you know what, I'm a child of God, get out of here. Because I'm a precious child, I was created in my mother's womb. He loves me, Jesus died for me. I'm a new creation in Christ. He has work for me to do. I may not be what he wants me to be, but I'm seated with him in the heavenlies. He sees me as a finished work. The more you stand on the truth, the less he can hurt your heart. It's when he has... An open door to your heart, and you listen to everything he says, and you don't hold to the word of God, to the truth, the truth, and say it aloud and believe it, and hold to it and keep repeating it. He's going to have a field day with you. But then, he, persevere, persevere. He says three times, stand. Stand. It means to make stand, to stand. We choose to stand. Folks, this is not, this is not the gospel advancing and driving out the enemy. This is you and me standing under spiritual attack and not being driven into the ground like a nail. Not being backed into over a cliff and to, to despair. Not being driven into fighting and attacking with friends or loved ones or even people who aren't friends and loved ones. Not curling up in a ball and just collapsing and feeling like we're getting the bejeepers kicked out of us. We stand. And it says, depending on your translation, there's a verse that says resist or withstand. That means that no matter, it's kind of like that strong building in the hurricane. It withstands those forces. It doesn't get blown over. It doesn't bend. It doesn't break. Folks, that's what God calls us to do. And so we need to remember that we may withstand one battle. You may make it through one day. You may make it through one hour. The battle is not over. The war is not over. The enemy is going to keep coming at you. We have to continually be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In Jesus, the more you spend time with Jesus, you give him time in the morning. And this is, I, my opinion, is not negotiable. Now, if you... If your morning is at 11 o'clock at night, then you do it then. Right? Yes. Spend time with God. Quiet time. Read his word. And then throughout the day, stop and say, where are you, Lord? What do you want to do? Are you saying anything to me? And you keep appealing to him. And you keep bringing to your mind what he's showed you. Folks, eventually you're going to feel his presence more and more all the time. And when those attacks come, and, and this is an example... Well, let me show you first about the importance of standing, and then I'll give you that example. Corrie ten Boom, tramp for the Lord, shared a little bit last week. She went into Germany, and she met a German attorney who had no legs. And he was bitter, and he was angry, and he shared, she shared Jesus with him, and she said, I told him my testimony, and then I walked away because I didn't want to go farther than the Lord was already working in him. And later she found, met him again, and he said he had received Christ. And he had asked her how he could deal with the hardness, the bitterness, and the hatred in his heart. And she said, if you will confess it to God, God will take it away from you. So he picked her up. He was driving a car that they had developed for him without legs. He said, don't you want to ride with a guy that doesn't have legs? And she said, sure, I'll ride with you. 
And he said, I, God has set me free. But here's the question. Does the bitterness come back? How many of you have forgiven someone and the bitterness keeps coming back? Come on, come on. Show your hands. There's a lot of us. Corey said, you know what? I have that too. She said, there was a couple who promised me something. They broke their promise and it hurt me badly. And so I had to go to God and in my bed one night, I prayed to God to forgive them and he took away that bitterness. And the next night, it came back. So I forgave him again. I said, you have the victory, Lord. And I had peace. And then it came back again the next night. And I said, Lord, I'm Corey Ten Boom who tells people to forgive people and get victory. And here I can't even get victory myself. And then she referenced Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. And she said, sometimes we just have to stand. We have to stand and say, I'm a child of God. I forgive them. God loves them. I love them. And stand on the truth regardless of how we feel. And so this is what he said. He said, I am glad to hear that. For sometimes my old bitterness returns. Now I shall just stand my ground, claim the victory of Jesus over fear and resentment, and love, and love even when I don't want to. That's what it means to stand. Jesus will help us. There is no easy solution. There's no one special prayer drives the enemy away and keeps him away, folks. It's not the way it works. If it did, God would have told you. Don't go looking for a special ministry that will teach you otherwise. If it's not in the word of God, be careful. There's no substitute for that living relationship with Jesus and trusting him. If God knew of another way and he wanted you to use it, he'd have given it. So a few weeks ago, I found in my journal actually over the weekend in a, it's a long story. I didn't go looking for it, but I found a journal entry around April 17th or 18th. And in it, I was tired and I was panicky and I was frightened. And I was just plain worried about ministry. It's like, Lord, I knew I was tired because of the way I was getting hit by things. I didn't recognize that it was a spiritual attack. But looking back, because I was getting hit when so many people in the church were getting hit, it was a spiritual attack. Fortunately, I found the passages in my journal from when we got on that two-day getaway in the cabin on the lakeshore. And in my first devotional time the next morning, God began to meet with me just through reading the word and praying. There's no substitute for the word, folks. He spoke to me through the word. And it gave me life. It was manna from heaven. And it began to strengthen me and encourage me. And over the next couple of days, I just continued to pray and seek God and read and study. And folks, he showed me. He refreshed me. He encouraged me. He'll do that for you. It's not because I'm a pastor. He does it for each of us if we'll draw near to him, bathe ourselves in Christ. What's that mean? You read it. You choose to believe it. You write down verses that stand out and mean something to you. You keep them close to you. There are verses I have to keep close to my heart to keep me encouraged. And God showed them to me. I didn't just open the Bible. I could just read through systematically and they stand out. It's like, wow, God, I don't know how you did that, but that's just what I needed for today. If you'll be faithful, he's faithful. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things here. And for a change, I didn't run over. Miracle of miracles. I'm going to ask.